Hey everyone, welcome back to the On Track Show. Today I am super excited to be talking about something I've never talked about on this show before and it sh I should have because it's a big part of my practice. It's something I get questioned about all the time which is intermittent fasting and just fasting in general. It's like the growing rage right now in the dieting world <laughs> in this past year. And so I've asked my fellow Canadian, who is the expert on fasting, Megan Ramos. She has worked alongside Dr. Jason Fung since 2003, and we'll get into who that is and what that's all about. She's a clinical researcher by trade with the majority of her research focusing in preventative medicine. Megan co-founded the Intensive Dietary Man Management Program with Dr. Jason Fung in 2014 after being diagnosed with diabetes herself and was the program's first guinea pig. So welcome, Megan. <laughs> thank you, Karen. <laughs> thanks for having me on and thanks to everybody listening today. Yeah. So I love that you went through, you were the first like, okay, let's try this on me and see how it's going to work. <laughs> well, so it, it was just both Jason Fung and I were at a sort of odd predicaments in our career. Uh, Jason was, you know, going into his 40s. He was a kidney specialist. So my, my colleague, Jason Fung, is a nephrologist. So okay. nephrology is the study of kidney disease. And throughout his career, he watched the, there be barely any kidney patients. It was so difficult for a nephrologist to get a job because not that many people had kidney disease to there just not being enough because there are so many patients with kidney disease because of diabetes. And I actually started doing research in nephrology when I was 14 and we went from just having a few dialysis beds to hundreds and the big boom was because of the dramatic increase in type 2 diabetes and that causing kidney disease. So Jason was getting really frustrated because he couldn't make the diabetic kidney disease better. If the diabetes just kept getting worse, then the kidneys were just going to get worse. And so it was really frustrating because you're there and you tell your patient you can't help them. And as a clinical researcher, I'm, I'm in my mid-20s um, at the time. I was thinking about going to medical school. And I thought, gosh, like, I don't want to be a doctor because all doctors do are watch people die. Like, I felt like that's all I was doing was watching these patients that I grew to love die from their diabetes and telling them, well, I'm sorry, sir, or sorry, ma'am, there's nothing we can do for your kidneys if your diabetes gets worse. And, well, guess what? Diabetes is thought to be a crap chronic progressive disease. So sayonara, you know, like it's yeah. bad news. And I got so depressed. I actually signed up to write my LSATs. Like I was just going to vacate medicine. I had, I was highly motivated, ambitious, you know, I was going to save the world. I just want to help people. Um, and I was like, Oh my gosh, I can't do that. So let me just follow in my family footsteps and go to law school and stop trying to be the black sheep of the family. Uh, Cause I was the only one that didn't go into law or business. <laughs> Um, but then shortly before I was supposed to write them, you know, my dietary habits caught up with me and I got, I was, I gained quite a bit of weight. It's funny how I gained weight. Um, I went from being a, a university student who was studying all of the time and forgetting to eat often. So in hindsight, I was fasting all of the time. <laughs> to someone in my mid-20s who thought to be the responsible adult and followed the Canadian food guide to a T and make sure that she was eating six to eight times throughout the day to stabilize her blood sugars. And I blew up, like that character on Willy Wonka who ate that funny, funky candy and just like That's blew what up. the Canadian food guide did to you, just this, <laughs> And the rest I, of Canada I, as well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was like a character out of Will. It was amazing. I gained almost 100 pounds. I'm five feet tall. Oh, my um, gosh. I was yeah. thinking you were one of those people, like, looking at you. I was like, oh, she was probably one of those people that stayed really thin but had type 2 diabetes. Like, you just didn't show no. it because you look like you're just naturally such a small person. Uh, no, I look chunked up. And patients, oh, my gosh. I, I, I love them and just all wanted to punch them at the same time because they'd be like, you've gained a lot of weight, but it's distributed nicely. Oh, and I'm like, it's good. Oh, thanks. Cause yeah. Fuck her off. Um, better. I know. It's like you've turned into a nicely distributed obese person. I, I don't know. Um, and along with that weight came the diagnosis of diabetes. And after I started doing 
research when I was 14. So at this point I was 27. And I, and then my own family history too is like a nightmare. So personally and professionally, I grew up just watching people that I cared about die from diabetic related complications. And I wasn't like, I was just call me insane, but I wasn't, I was going to be the first person ever to like conquer this. And I, I was hell bent on fixing it. If that meant that I had to walk around doing a handstand all day, I was going to develop the upper body strength to do so. It didn't really matter. And so fortunately, I was working with a goofy guy um, who was also going through his own life transitions and really just thinking outside of the box out of being desperate. And he had experimented with low-carb diets with some of his patients, um, but he quickly realized that low-carb just wasn't enough. It was certainly helpful and a huge improvement across the board, but it wasn't enough. And it was also... In that day and age, that we're going back several years, was low carb wasn't popular, it wasn't trendy, um, so it was more more difficult to convince a patient to do it, uh, and there was a, definitely a lack of support. Nowadays, my, my husband went to a Starbucks recently and he asked for heavy cream. And they said, "Oh, do you do the ketogenic diet?" And so, but so, well, this is going back almost nine years ago now. It, people would look at you like you're crazy. Yeah. So um, we, we really struggled with the, I knew he was doing this with the patients. I was actually trying to help a bit. I was trying to do it myself, but I was born in 84. I, I was born several years after the McGovern report. I grew up with two very busy parents, one very sick parent, and I was also spoiled. So if I didn't like the roast that was being cooked for dinner because I felt like I wanted pizza, my parents were too tired to argue with me and they let me order pizza. So I grew up eating like garbage. I didn't know how to cook. I, no one really cooked at home. We ate out most of the time. Uh, so. It, I didn't know what to do. So I struggled with low carb too. I sustained pretty much on pasta, pizza, and french fries for most of my existence up until that point. Um, so, uh, <laughs> well, Jason, Jason had a friend who was doing some fasting for spiritual reasons, but was getting great weight loss and an improvement in blood sugar levels. And he thought, you know, Jason comes from a Catholic family. You know, there's always that he, he knew a lot of our patients participate in Ramadan. Um, so he started to think, well, why is fasting? Like it's, it's obviously, it's not just for spiritual reasons, it's for therapeutic reasons. That's why every major religion incorporates a, a feasting and fasting alternate rhythm, you know, over the course of the year between holidays. So he started doing a bunch of research and like had his big aha moment um, that it's not just what you eat, but it's also when you eat. Mm -hmm. And he <laughs> gave me this stack of articles um, on religion and fasting and the therapeutic side of it, not just the spiritual benefits, but the therapeutic side of it. And just starting to think about it, I brought a strong background in physiology and I had this aha moment. I went through like all of the stages <laughs> like of, of like, oh my gosh, I found the cure to being so mad, to hating my parents, to just being sad at the state of the world, to like accepting that this is what I needed to do. Um, and I started doing it and like I hated it at first. Um, everyone thought I was crazy. I thought my father was going to get me committed. He talked about <laughs> getting power of attorney over me. I had this weird eating disorder. I had to do it in secret. Um, which and added how, how are you doing it? Like were you doing days, 24 hour fast? what were you doing the first month I did 24 hours of fasting now you have to keep in mind for a couple of years leading up to that I ate high carb so I ate foods that really stimulated insulin production and enough so to for me to gain all that weight and develop diabetes um, but to you know really throw all my hormones out of whack and to you know be hungry in a constant state and literally for two years as I started eating more often I just like wanted to eat more all of the time and I was just eating all day like non-stop and so many people around me were eating the same like our medical clinic it was like who's like whose job is it to bring in cookies this Monday who's bringing in the donuts on Wednesday and the people around me were eating non-stop so for me I, it was definitely more mind like over the physical aspect of it, like I was clearly surviving, but mentally it, that was the challenging part for me. But after the first month, I was getting results. So I was doing 24 hours, three times a week, 
Okay. And I went from diabetic to borderline diabetic, almost pre-diabetic. My A1C went to six. I was actually losing weight for the first time. I'd spent all kinds of money on fancy dietitians and personal trainers. And I, I did gain lean mass doing like training, but I wasn't losing in body fat. So, um, so I was actually getting results. And I thought, oh God, like this is working. Okay, I found something that's working. I have to change my attitude about it. And, you know, like, yeah, those people around me can eat all that stuff. Obviously, it's making them sick. And I don't want to be a sick person. Like, this is why, you know, you said you'd do anything to get rid of this diabetes. It looks like you have a shot. So commit to it. So after the, I got my first month's blood test back, I had that reality check with myself. And I was like, get your head in the game. You know, think of this as a therapy. And if you really dedicate it, like dedicate yourself to it. You're not going to drag out this forever. You'll get it done. You'll get it over with. So I took six months and I treated it like each fasting day was like me going to the hospital for chemotherapy. Like I thought of it as a real therapeutic treatment and there would be good days and there would be bad days. There would be days where I miss out a little bit on social events or I wouldn't feel like going out because I wasn't feeling great. And there'd be days where I'd feel on top of the world. And I just had to look at it as my therapy. So in six months, my A1C went to 4.6%. I lost over 60 pounds. I've lost 80, I lost 86 um, to date, um, but I gained a lot of lean mass too. So I've lost 86 pounds. So I'm at my lowest body fat percentage. Um, I had no more fatty liver and PCOS, which were other issues that I was contending wow. with as well. All in six months from just being ded like dedicated, and I got rid of all of this. I was actually diagnosed with fatty liver when I was 12 and PCOS when I was 14, but I was a skinny fat person then, right. and no one realized that. They just thought I was underweight, but I was obese right. still. Um, and were you so, uh, eating, what kind of foods were you eating in between those three days of fasting? So I, um, I definitely, my diet is a trend was a transition. Yeah. It's been a real evolution. You know, I went from having a couple high carb meals a week to one a week to one a month to one a few times every now and then, um, you know, relying on berries to help me get through sweet cravings, but then not craving sweets anymore and not buying the berries. Um, so it definitely wasn't perfect. I, I tried, I did, I did my best that I could. Um, but by the end of the six months, uh, I was pretty low carb, pretty ketogenic. I'd say, you know, every other month I would go out at that time and, and have a little bit of a splurge. But it was different, you know, instead of going out to a pizzeria and eating a whole pizza, I would make sure that I had a salad. I was drinking water. I wasn't going to have wine or any cocktails. And if I was going to have pizza, I wasn't going to have a dessert. And I was going to make sure I all of that salad plus other charcuterie items to really make me feel full so I would only eat a slice of pizza then a whole pizza um, but since then though this is going back several years I just don't have the cravings or desires as much like every now and then I do and I realize it's more of an emotional situation but it was funny because um, uh, my bachelorette party um, was uh, three years ago on January 1st and my friends took me out for an Italian food. Despite my name and my appearance, I come from a very Italian family. I look like I'm adopted, but I'm a lot like these people. Um, so I don't think I am. And uh, I, I survived off of pasta. So my friends took me to an Italian restaurant. They're like, oh, it's the night before your wedding. And I ordered pasta and I just didn't enjoy it. Like I took like two forks yeah. full and I sent it back and I got a steak. And for someone who ate pasta, not joking, like at least five times a week, I haven't had it in three years. Like I just don't care for it at all anymore. Yeah, I'm the uh, same. I'm totally the same. I, I have lost all interest in it. And it's, yeah. I try and encourage people that it does take time. Like I would say it took me a couple yeah. of years to get to that point where that's not my treat anymore to go yeah. for pizza or pasta. I would never, that was not what my choice is now. I would go for ice cream instead. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's totally crazy how, how things shift. Um, when yeah. I, when I got my great results, patients, I was at the time working on this prospective research study with 2,800 patients. Yeah. And so they, they were all seeing me very regularly. Um, yeah. And they saw the transformation and they're like, honestly, we don't care what you're doing. We want to do it. And I think Jason and I are sort of blessed because we are in the city of Toronto. 
Toronto is the most multicultural, diverse place on the, in the world. Over 50% of the population wasn't born in Toronto. So you have a lot of people who, when they were back home in their home countries, they were fasting. It was part of their religion. It was part of their culture. It wasn't foreign to them. Mm -hmm. And so like when I, I have a, a, had a Muslim patient come in for the first time, and he's like, but I can drink water? This is easy. This is a joke because during yeah. Ramadan, yeah, like, <laughs> so, uh, so you know, patients were very willing, and then the willing patients got good results, which inspired the unwilling patients because right. there was no way they could turn their heads at you know 100 patients who had reversed their diabetes. No. Uh, so we really, we were, I think, geographically sort of blessed, and you know, that nowadays like low carb is so popular, ketogenic diet, which is extreme low carb, is popular. I'd say I, I'm in a state of ketosis. Regardless, I don't really censor my carbs, but um, I don't eat star starches. I don't eat grains, um, but I will never limit the number of Brussels sprouts that I eat. Uh, no, yeah, so, I'm the same. Yeah, yeah. So I eat a lot of un, un um, not like unrefined, like un, non-starchy, uh, fibrous carbohydrates, and. Um, so I, I'm in I'm in ketosis. Really, not trying to get into it, but. Uh, or like really I don't restrict my carbs to 20 or less but I find that even at 60 or plus grams of non-starchy fibrous carbs I'm in a deep state of ketosis so um, yeah. so I'm getting those potential benefits so the patients saw me and they they begged and so we sort of developed this little program at, we thought was like a little pilot program and eventually some higher power was going to get really mad at us and make a stop but it was we just got sort of bombarded and my colleague Jason I think he spent like every night um, you know just you're so motivated you're seeing patients get better for the first time he has been like every night writing these books the obesity code and the diabetes code and he's like I've, I've got to get like what we're learning and this knowledge and I've got to get it out there so um, and then they became kind of popular <laughs> uh, and it's just the last couple of years have just been really crazy but I'm, yeah. I'm really happy to, in the end I get to do what I always wanted to do help people and actually help them get better um, just a totally different approach I find though like you most people look at me and they're like what the heck does she know about being overweight <laughs> um, so I find that I have to I have to share like on my phone in clinic I keep a, a before, <laughs> the before of my picture. <laughs> yeah I'm like this is legit like this is me like I've got like tattoo markings you can't make up right and, <laughs> so photoshopped. <laughs> no. no. So, and so fast forward from kind of that three day a week fasting, is that still basically the you know, when you when somebody comes in who's insulin resistant, type two diabetic, yeah. is that the starting point is three days a week of twenty four hour fasts? That's usually where we start people or thirty six hours of fasting. Sometimes we'll encourage them to skip dinner or skip that one meal a day. So most often people do a 24 hour fast they, from dinner tonight until dinner tomorrow. So during a 24 hour fast, you miss two consecutive meals. So usually we're so busy in the morning, work days, you know, it's easy to skip lunch at work. Uh, so most of the time people do skip breakfast and lunch. And we encourage them to try to eat an earlier dinner if possible. And if they can fast from lunch to lunch, we encourage that. Um, but that's not suitable for everybody. So dinner to dinner, especially if they can do an easy dinner. Um, but for a 36 hour fast, you would just simply skip that dinner. So uh, if you think about it throughout the weekdays, Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays, you wouldn't eat, but Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, and Sunday, you'd eat breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So you'd be fasting, for example, from Sunday after dinner until Tuesday morning. So 36 hours sounds kind of wonky. I'm like, we should have totally coined this a better phrase because uh, it's really confusing, but it's very clear cut. You eat, right. you fast, you eat, you fast. Right. And what about with somebody, because I think of myself, it almost just puts me in a state of panic when you know, I just hear you say that, is with bad blood sugar issues, like hypoglycemia. Is it okay to have someone go 24 hours if they're not feeling well? 
you so just we, push through it? <laughs> so there's there's different different levels, and, and we so with the patients we adjust their medications, or if we are not in the position where we can adjust their medications, we start off a lot more slowly. Like we go from eating six times a day to three times a day, and cutting out snacking, and gradually cutting out meals, just to be very very cautious. So there's no hypoglycemia, and in the clinic where we do have control over the patient's medications. We do drop them to make their blood sugar levels go higher to prevent against hypoglycemia. We see them very regularly at the start because some people come off of 100 units of insulin overnight and some people take six months. So it's very different for the individual depending on the severity of their insulin resistance. In terms of not feeling well, like if you feel just like you have the flu, we encourage our patients just to push through. Mm -hmm. If you feel like you know you can't keep up with your daily activities, it wouldn't be you don't feel comfortable driving. Um, then call it quits and let's start off doing something more modified and work our way up to doing a twenty four hour fast. Um, and if nausea is our, our absolute red flag, if you feel nauseous, you must call it quits. That, of course, and actually getting a low blood sugar levels. But we're very cautious with that approach. Mm -hmm. You know, I always tell people that fasting is like a muscle. Um, I, and I always joke, my, my husband, I met him in San Francisco, I dragged him to Canada, and we spent three years on an airplane um, and not being active whatsoever. And so when he got to Canada, I was like, oh, okay, we're living downtown by like 10 of the hottest gyms in the city. So I like created this presentation for him so he could pick the gym and get in shape. And he's like, Megan, we sat on our ass, you know, for three years, like, get over yourself. He said, tomorrow morning, let's stretch and see how you feel. And I stretched and I was sore for three days. Yeah. <laughs> he says, yeah, we're not spending like 400 bucks a month at a gym for you. Forget it. You know, like you, you got to start off. And so, and, but it's different for everybody. Like, you know, my, uh, my best friend and I can go into the gym and I can deadlift my own leg own weight um, and she can deadlift you know an extra 20 pounds um, it, and that's just and we started doing weight training at the same time so it's you know everybody has their, their different yes. capacities for yeah. things so you know you might really want to do a 24-hour fast but your body might just not be your fasting muscle and your in your body might just not be there yet so you know getting back to the basics you know, like our grandmothers, uh, how they grew up and grandparents, you know, you ate your meals, you didn't eat a snack before dinner to make sure you had your appetite for dinner. You sure as heck didn't eat after dinner because then that meant you didn't eat enough of, of the good meal on your plate. So going back to basics, you know, my grandmother, so she is so funny. She's like, you know, your dad didn't get fat until he moved out of his house, uh, out of my house. She, she's like, I never sent him to school with all that junk food that you guys go to. He was lucky if he got an apple. Um, he certainly didn't eat junk. Potato chips were for big occasions like Canada Day family barbecues or a special yeah. treat for someone's birthday. She's like, I didn't have a cold cellar full of potato chips like you guys have at your at your house. You know, my mom would go to Costco and buy each of us our Costco sized bag of potato chips and we eat them because it was a Tuesday. Like there was no rhyme or reason. And uh, so just sort of going back to the basics and you know, and just even doing that cuts out a lot of the carbs that we'd otherwise consume throughout the day. Mm -hmm. And then work on teaching the, the patients, you know, then you know, to shop around the aisles at the grocery store and eat real foods. And then once they're comfortable, their blood sugar levels are stable, then maybe cutting out breakfast or cutting out dinner and doing more of what we call like a 16 hour fast for you to skip one meal a day and working our way up to 24 hours. I believe right. most people are capable of doing any fast they like, but they have to, everyone has to start off somewhere different. Yeah. And so it, what's the medical benefits of a 24 hour fast compared to an intermittent fast where it's just a 16 hour fast, which seems to be what's most popular with people. I know I put it into a lot of my meal plans where you just skip that morning meal and you don't eat till noon or whatever. And it seems like that's such an easy way for people to fast. But is there a difference in the benefits that you're going to be getting? There's something else happening in the body. Well, so it just sort of depends on where you are in your in your health journey. For someone who's uh, 
very healthy or moderately healthy or just has a little bit of uh, metabolic issues, a few extra pounds, a 16-8 is fantastic. You know, it will drop those extra few pounds, it will regulate the hormones, you'll feel great. Um, it's something that I practice now I'm coming off of the holidays and moving and eating out at every restaurant in Toronto. So I'm in the, I'm almost 36 hours into a fast right now or just under 36. Um, so it's, you know, it's periodically doing one of these longer ones after holidays to compensate can be helpful. But the, you know, why I would ask a patient to do a 24 over 16 is if that patient's more metabolically unwell, has um, more hormones that are out of whack, has struggled with insulin toxicity, so high levels of insulin in the body, essentially poisoning the body and causing the disease for a longer time. Um, it, we really target patients with high insulin levels and fasting really suffocates the insulin levels and it keeps them down. And when you keep an insulin level down for a long enough time, it's suffocating it and it sort of breaks that barrier. Um, where your insulin levels aren't going to go up very much. So if we think our body's like a thermostat, everything in our body's like a thermostat. Um, so it's always trying to keep things at the same, the thermostat tries to keep everything at the same temperature. So it will turn on the heat, it'll turn on the, the fan, the air conditioning to bring the, your room back to 73 degrees. Um, and our bodies, you know, get so used to having an insulin level that's so high, it tries to fight it. So, you know, when you're doing sort of a 16 hour fast, it's not really powerful enough to fight that set point but a longer fast like a 24-hour fast and sometimes that's not enough sometimes a 36-hour fast is absolutely necessary to fight that set point and keep the insulin level so low for a sustained period of time that you actually drop the temperature on the thermostat for the insulin setting if that makes any sense yeah no I think that's a good analogy to say it because I I think that uh, it's it it would be so hard to do the 24 hour fast, but I, it, it is more therapeutic. I think is what you're trying to say. Like it is more yeah. like if the sicker you are, the, the probably the longer you should be going. So let's go the yeah. other way for somebody that has been fasting like yourself. You, you've lost the weight. You've, you've been doing the three days a week. You're, you're at a good spot. Is there like a, a maintenance that you should be doing? Like, what do you do when you're not like just normal every day? What's now, what are you doing? Usually I stick to 16, eight. Um, and I, I, I eat breakfast, but I eat, I wake up at four 30. Um, I do all my emails. We have some partners that we work with in the UK. So deal with any issues related to them. Then I go to the gym, come home, shower, eat. So I'm awake for a good four hours before I eat. And then we'll eat like a, a late lunch, sort of usually around two or three o'clock. And that's just, that's what we do. Um, if I ever overdo it, uh, then I will take a period of time and do a little bit more in therapeutic fasting like I used to when I was healing my metabolic syndrome. So the last last uh, Christmas season, I celebrate Christmas, um, I didn't overdo it. I was in Orlando with my husband's family. Everybody was sick. We, none of us feasted. So in January, I just kept up my 16 eight. Um, this December, I was home, I moved, I had visitors, my mom was sick. Um, I ate out solely at restaurants and I stuck to really great options. There's great options, but you never know how they prep things. You'll get a balsamic vinaigrette and there's, you can taste the sweetness in it. Or even like I had a rotisserie chicken uh, and I could tell it was brined in sugar just because I'm so sensitive to sugar now. So you've got all these hidden things in your food. I gained a little bit of weight. I felt bloated. I felt tired. So despite my best efforts at eating out, it, it was not, uh, not a great end result. So now for the month of January, I'm taking advantage of the slow social time of the year. And I'm just for this month, I'm just going to do the therapeutic fasting that I used to do until I feel better. And it's different for everybody. You know, a patient of mine might not have eaten out as much as I did, or maybe they didn't indulge too much, but they're feeling off. And I usually tell these patients then who are in the maintenance mode, I guess you'd call it, mm -hmm. um, to do just the therapeutic fasting until they feel good again. 
So if that's like a week or if it's two weeks or if it's a month, just until they feel good again. And I can sort of, you can eventually gauge it after time. Like I know if I go away and I'm eating at restaurants because I'm on a, at a resort, um, or in other people's company and they're cooking and uh, there's hidden sugars, uh, you know, I can gauge it. It's like, okay, this is probably pretty bad. It's going to take me a week or two weeks, you know, till I get back on track. So I just encourage people just do it till you, you feel like your old self again, and then just get back into your 16, eight routine. Yeah. And I don't know if you find this, but I find with, cause I use it a lot with clients to help them initially to lose the weight more, more intermittent fasting than the 24 hour. And I see it work so good in the beginning. And then I have had a few clients who it does start to drive the thyroid down or it starts to mess negatively with their hormones. And my, my theory on it is that we're going into you know, we're obviously we're in a caloric deficit overall. If you're looking at the week or the month, you're in this caloric deficit. And what does that start to signal to our bodies at a certain point when there's not a, not a lot of body fat on us? It's going to tell the body to hold on to the fat and drive down the metabolism, just you know, cool it. Down. Like we don't want to be burning up the little bit of fat that we have left on our body, kind of a biological thing that happens. Um, so at that point, should somebody just stick with the intermittent fasting? Can they still do like a 24 hour fast every couple of weeks? Like where's, is there kind of a sweet spot if somebody's hit that spot? Yeah, absolutely. It, it is a concern. I actually work with a lot of professional athletes and they're, you know, a whopping 7% body fat, but they're trying to fast for therapeutic reasons, which does mean sort of entering that 24 hour plus zone of fasting. Um, but I mean, their, their whole livelihood too depends on them maintaining their muscle mass, being in good physical shape, um, not feeling tired, you know, so we've got to keep their thyroid, their hormones, everything's got to maintain where they are we just have to use a fasting so we really um, up the fat to really make sure that they're not going in a caloric deficit so I work with um, George St. Pierre for example from the yeah. UFC yeah. and you know for him it's like really increasing that fat you know on your eating days if he typically eats you know like 3,000 calories a day then we're adding another 1,000 to 1,500 calories of just fat fat into the diet. And I think a lot of people think of fat and think butter, eggs, bacon, but it's not. It's utilizing lots of olive oil, cooking vegetables with coconut oil, utilizing avocado oil. If you have an avocado, slice it up and douse it with two tablespoons of olive oil. Right. Or MCT oil and just a variety of ways just to sort of sneak these fats in. And that way we're, we're able to sort of maintain their, their hormone levels were able to maintain you know their thyroid function and their body weight too yeah. uh so i have someone like gsp who fasted for his colitis and you know we were getting into the point where we were doing four-day fasts and he was able to train and feel good and be able to maintain his body composition throughout everything wow so you know of course we don't do like that's not a weekly thing he's not doing that weekly everybody it's you know every like four weeks we try one and then trying to do like maybe two 24 hour fasts a week. Whereas with someone who's trying to lose weight and who's diabetic, we would try to do more than two a week. So it's definitely scaling it back, but really finding creative ways to add in that fat, you know, a tablespoon of olive oil is 115 calories. It's yeah. 14 grams of fat. So, and it's really easy to eat a lot of olive oil. I drink olive oil. It, <laughs> um, it, it's a great way to add in fat and add in calories to sort of maintain the weight if you're looking to do a longer fast. Yeah, I love that. I, I, I think that that's a really good thing for my listeners to hear because women, they hear, oh, I can fast and lose all this weight. And it's, you know, it's, this is what I'm going to do. And then they end up going into this starved state eventually yeah. and it starts to backfire. And I remember talking to Jimmy Moore on his podcast and he was saying, no, you've got to eat those calories if after you fasted, like you can't not make up for them, right? Especially once you've lost the weight. In the beginning that it's good, it's therapeutic, it's going to help with your insulin resistance and your type 2 diabetes, but then there is that fine line. And fat is the most calorically dense macronutrient, so it's the easiest way to get those calories in without adding a bunch of sugar back into your diet either. 
And it's so important for normal hormone function too, is totally. to get the fat. And so especially when you're on the slender side of things, if you want to stay balanced and you know not place your body into a spot where it's too uncomfortable, you've got to eat that fat just to help aid you hormonally. And so that's the thing I struggle with the most too with patients, males and females, is um, making sure that they are feasting and fasting and like feasting doesn't mean like you're eating to the point where you're taking off your yeah Yeah. donuts having to take off your pants because you know you decide to eat that third steak of the night (laughs) um it's not that but just like eating enjoying proper meals my patients who fast a lot but who gain weight are those who on their eating day are eating like bunnies if you can't do that you've got to you have to eat to lose weight you have to eat to lose weight and to maintain your metabolic rate Oh, I'm so glad you said that. I love it because I, I can't, like, I totally agree with that. There's got to be both. And, and that yeah. is the best way to, to lose weight. And women don't know that you make your hormones through good cholesterol and good cholesterol mm-hmm. is coming from good fat. So yeah. you have got to get that fat in there. And, and for fertility, like if you're in your fertile years, you got to be really gentle with your, with that system. And if you're, being, yeah. you're starving it all the time, it's going to drive down fertility, right? So I think that that's, that's so important for everybody to hear. So big question here that I know everybody wants to know, including myself, is what about when there's a lot of different ways of fasting right now? One of the most popular, of course, is the bulletproof fasting, where you have the coffee and the fat in the morning. Uh, and so a question is, is there things like if you're, as long as it's just fat, are you breaking the benefits of the fast? <laughs> So it, it depends on what your goals are. So if you're a healthy individual, you know, looking to maintain your weight, but get some of the hormonal benefits of fasting just to stay healthy, then having a bulletproof coffee is perfectly fine. It's a great way to get fat in. Um, it's not going to raise your insulin levels. And, you know, it's really that high toxic levels of insulin that creates a lot of disease. So the fat is not going to do that. So enjoy your bulletproof coffee. If you're looking to lose weight, though, when you're in a fast to stay you I know this sounds really gross but you want to be feasting off of like your fat here nice. and your fat here and you don't want to be feasting off of your fat here when you're in a fast um so if you are looking to lose weight it's better to sort of sort of avoid that but if you're if you're healthy it's a great way to get fat in I know we're so busy nowadays one of my biggest issues with 2018 and my husband and I we joked I joked yesterday I said if we ever like win the lotto we're hiring a personal chef because we get so busy there's no time to cook you're not really eating or fasting and I ended up a hormonal wacky mess in the middle of the year and we really had to buckle down and make meals a priority again um but the fat's just it's just so like the the fat is great because you do get busy so eat drinking those fatty coffees or fatty teas is a great way just to make sure you're getting in everything you need throughout the day if you're healthy and looking looking to maintain yeah a quick fat bomb down right yeah (laughs) Yeah, so bone broth then those um any sort of like a little bit is okay but you are that is intervening you burning your own fat off your body then until that's burned up yeah okay that's good to know (laughs) <laughs> because it's, you know, it is all the rage. I do it. I, I, that's how I intermittent fast. I find it's much more tolerable, but I also don't need to lose weight. So I find it's, it's, I had bone broth today and I'm in the midst of a fast. Um, you know, I, I didn't drink it all day long. I had it, I woke up at four 30. I had it at 12 30, you know, just to sort of help break yeah. up my day and, uh, it makes you feel good. It's great for you. So, you know, if you're not combating insulin issues, then why not? Yep, exactly. Yeah. Well, I love it. And so do you guys work with people from all over the place? Are you guys, or is it just in clinic? No, it's all over. Actually, our, our clinic is very, very tiny. Um, now I'm spending a lot of my time trying to educate other doctors on how to do fasting with their patients so I can share what we've learned. So we really don't do too much in clinic stuff anymore. Um, but most of our programs on online, I, you know, we felt that it was so unfair that we couldn't see non-Canadian patients. Mm-hmm. And especially like, we're spoiled. Like I, we have great healthcare. Like when I met my husband and just sort of 
learning about his mom and her healthcare in the US, I was just brokenhearted and I felt so grateful. And I felt bad for every time I complained about Canadian healthcare. Um, so just like, just this need to help these people and share. And of course, they can't come to Canada always. And, you know, medically, legally, we can't treat them. But can we help them out with fasting? Absolutely. Can we teach them about, you know, when to eat and all of that stuff? Ab absolutely, wherever they are in the world. So uh, I've trained a team of people who worked with us for a long time. And we actually work with over 10,000 people worldwide uh, nowadays. And it's all online. And it's a, a, a video conferencing. And if you don't have internet, um, that's not a problem. You can always call into your appointments as well. Um, but we do these small group appointments so people get a community. It's kind of neat because I have patients from all over that connect and they go on vacations and stuff together and they form their own fasting community in their personal lives. Um, so we, we, do, uh, we do online counseling and we have an online self-guided program. So if you're someone who's a little bit more reserved, uh, doesn't want to share with a, share with a group, uh, you know, is figuring most of it out on their own. It doesn't really need that much support. We have an online uh, self-guided program as well. Wow, that's great. And I'll put the link in the show notes, but it is idmprogram.com, correct? Yes. And so if you're looking to start incorporating fasting into your own regime, I highly suggest checking it out. It's definitely one of the best programs that's out there that incorporates fasting. So and they're doing it right. You guys have done your research. You're doing it right. And it's, you guys are really helping a lot of people through it. So it's amazing. Thank you, Karen. All right. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show today, Megan. No problem. Thanks, Karen. And happy fasting, everyone.